I've been standing here trying to come up with a witty intro, but today I'm just running on caffeine and spite. So it's not happening. We'll just have to jump into it. So this is the Kingslayer from Yomikoni. This was sent to me for free for review. And as you'll see, there's not much of a bias here, if any. Um, I got this quite a few months ago and I held off on it because they were having trouble getting things shipped out. The Chinese customs apparently weren't letting things out of the country due to the COVID situation, presumably. And so I held off on it. Uh, I don't know if the situation has changed. It's been a while. Hopefully they have now caught up, but shipping is still a problem elsewhere. Canada Post is also way behind and it's taking like a month longer than usual. And that's enough tangential rambles. So about the sword. The original that this reproduction here is based on is associated with Zhu Di, who was the third emperor of the Ming Dynasty, the Yongluo Emperor, who reigned between 1402 and 1424. I was told that this was a ceremonial sword that was worn by the emperor on special occasions. According to another source, this was made as a diplomatic gift from the Yongla Emperor to a Tibetan Lama, the Buddhist spiritual leader, not the fuzzy animal with a long neck. In case you were confused about that, the royal armories pointed out that it's unsure whether it was a gift to a Tibetan ruler or monastery or whether it was made for the emperor himself. Uh, either way, so the original has enormous value as a prestige symbol. It was very richly decorated with gold, silver, and semi-precious gems. It also has a Sanskrit inscription on the scabbard that translates either to honorific sword or precious sword. There are a number of high-end reproductions of this sword. Uh, some of them cost several thousand dollars, some even 10,000 and up. So this was made as a more affordable version of the same sword. The current price on Yomikuni's website is 629 Canadian dollars or 467 US dollars. In terms of accuracy, it looks a bit different to the original because it's not gold and silver, obviously. The fittings are made of bronze, uh, antique bronze, and the, the grip is different. It's dark here. It's a uh, ray skin, apparently and it does not have that decorated line in the center of the grip that the original does. I would say there are no drastic deviations other than you know, material and color. Upon closer examination, I have to correct myself here. If this really is the sword they were trying to represent, it's not all that similar. The proportions are significantly different, especially the handle length. The details also deviate noticeably. It almost looks as if somebody tried to recreate it from memory after seeing it once. The blade is also a little bit different. The point on the original is more rounded, but overall it looks like the blade profile is pretty similar. It is a beautiful looking sword. You know, if you just Take a closer look at all the decorations here. It is really nice. You've got the gem eyes here. You've got ornamental borders, the bronze fittings, all the scabbard are extremely nice. It's quite a heavy duty scabbard too. It's, it's pretty hefty overall and seems well made. There don't seem to be any issues. There are no cracks. The finish is really good overall. And that's really what the sword is all about. I mean, the original was not designed for use. Clearly, it was either meant as a ceremonial sword or as a gift. Either way, it was really more to symbolize something than to actually achieve something on the battlefield or in a duel. So we have to keep that in mind, of course, but at the same time, there's no way I'm not gonna test it, of course, which I did. So I did some cutting on tatami mats and it, performed quite well. It cuts nicely, good edge. The only thing I noticed is that compared to earlier Chinese swords, this one feels rather clunky really. And at first I was wondering if that's a problem with the reproduction, but then I checked the weight and uh, the original one weighs 1 1.296 kilograms. And this one here weighs 1. 
235. So this is actually slightly lighter, but overall very close to the original. It's not heavy by any means, but compared to a Han Dynasty Jin, this seems like quite the clunker. It's basically almost twice the weight of this while being shorter. It has a significantly wider blade and it's also way thicker, as you can hopefully see. The Han Jian feels extremely light and maneuverable, very agile. Basically, you, you just need a couple of fingers to, to move it around, really. Uh, this, on the other hand, it's not poorly balanced by any means. If you look at the, the point of balance here, it's not terribly far from the guard, but at the same time, it's also a rather short blade. And for the size, it feels like a bit of a dead weight. It does not have the lively feel of the other one. In fact, it makes me kind of want to, to get as high as possible with the hand and, and get the finger over here. So this feels a little more controlled, but it's definitely much more of a cutter than the other one in the sense that it's, it delivers a more powerful cut. Uh, this one here, cuts perfectly well, but you certainly notice the extra mass here. So this would hit quite a bit harder. But at the same time, as said, this was not designed for fighting. From what I heard, Ming Dynasty swords were generally heavier than Han Dynasty. So seems to have been a general tendency. As I keep handling it, it it's really not heavy in and of itself. It's just the the star contrast to the, the ultralight Han Dynasty sword. This in and of itself is, is perfectly fine. It's just going from one to the other. It's kind of odd. I also did a little bit of harder cutting to test the structural integrity. And what I noticed is that after a couple of swings, it started to loosen up. I could feel it in the hilt, but it's really not a big deal with this kind of construction because there is a nut on top here that you can unscrew and so you can easily tighten this. Also, it has another nut down here. So this is just the one that holds the pommel in place. So, you know, if you had to unscrew the pommel, you can do that. Uh, and the pommel is hollow, by the way, which is good because if this was solid, it would add even more weight to it and that would get a little excessive, but uh, it was actually quite a good design. And so you can tighten this individually if you had to. And the good thing is that this did not move at all from the cutting. It was really just the nut on top. And uh, so that's really not a problem. And since we're already at it, might as well disassemble it entirely to take a look at the tang. I have to say, even though it's not necessarily a problem, I don't like seeing this thread here. I was gonna say it looks like one piece, but then again, there is a bit of discoloration here. So that suggests that heat was applied here. And the only reason for that would be to weld this on. Hmm, if that's the case, uh, not a fan of that. I mean, it's not necessarily a problem to weld a thread onto a tang. If you do it properly, it's fine. But that does concern me a little bit. I would prefer if it was shaped from the tang as one piece and then just threaded at the end. So slightly skeptical about that. And I'm seeing that the guard itself is also hollow, which you really need to do. If this entire thing was solid with just a, a slot in the center, that would add substantial amount of weight to it. So in short, I can say that I'm amazed by the construction in this sense. Um, at the same time, it's not designed really as a, as a use sword. So you have to keep that in mind. It's basically a sturdier wall hanger in a way. It feels, feels dirty to say that even because it is functional, but that's really not the, it's not the goal here, it's not the purpose of the sword. My issue with this is a little bit, I don't quite see where it fits in. Like who would want this specifically? Because it's not for backyard cutting. It's not for practical use. 
really. And as a wall hanger, I mean, it's far more affordable than the other versions I've seen. You know, under 500 US dollars compared to several thousand or even 10,000. But for just something to look at, just to have on your wall, that's still quite a bit of money. Plus, you may also be a little hesitant to use a highly decorated sword like this and risk scratching it up or otherwise damaging it and what have you. And what I do have to say is there's absolutely nothing wrong with the blade. The blade is perfectly good. It is very well shaped, you know, good blade profile overall, really nice edges, and it seems a durable steel as well. And not everybody who collects swords wants to do backyard cutting with them. So in that sense, you do get more for the money compared to say a $150 wall hanger, of course. So the quality is noticeable. You know, the metal work on this is very nice. I'm not seeing any flaws anywhere really. So fit and finish, great. Construction, you know, with the thread, possibly welded on thread, a little iffy. But other than that, it's, it's beautiful craftsmanship, no doubt about it. So in short, it's not really for me personally, for my purposes, but somebody else might enjoy this quite a bit in their collection. So take it for what it's worth. I'll leave the link down below. As I said, keep in mind that there might be issues with shipping. So that's another thing to consider. So basically my verdict is I would not personally recommend it as such. If what you're looking for is a beautifully made fancy looking collector sword that has some functionality to it, then yeah, this may be up your alley. If you're more into high performance utilitarian swords, then definitely something like this is gonna be better. So yeah, that's about it. Hope you found it helpful. Thanks for watching and have a good one, folks.